All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for your patience with, uh, I just had a very chaotic day, um, but I am excited to be here tonight to tell you a little bit about some of the work that my lab has been doing over the past few years, um, thinking a lot about uh, the different consequences of dispersal or the movement of individuals across a fragmented landscape. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is tell you kind of snippets from a bunch of different projects that I've just kind of tried to weave together into this theme of understanding how does individual movement um, affect populations? And we'll be thinking about kind of the genetic level, um, how it affects changes in population sizes over time or demographics and also um, potential impacts on individual fitness or survival and reproduction. All right, so why do we care so much about dispersal? So dispersal is this process, right, where individuals move across the landscape, and it can influence biological processes at many different levels. So on the individual level, um, dispersal can affect an individual's inbreeding um, level. And so here, inbreeding simply refers to how much of one's genome um, is, has the same copy. Um, has this, so every individual, right, has two copies of their genome. Um, and if your parents are related, you're more likely to inherit a chunk of your genome from the same ancestor back in time, um, which means that throughout your genome, you're more likely to be what's called homozygous or have um, two copies of the same allele for a given um, locus. And inbreeding can be a problem because it can decrease your survival and reproductive success, which um, is what we call individual fitness. At the population level, so now zooming out, right, a collection of multiple individuals forms a population. Um, and levels of dispersal, or how much different individuals move, how far they move, and when they move across the landscape, can have really important effects on um, kind of patterns of genetic variation across space. Um, and this is called spatial genetic structure. Um, so what this means essentially is that dispersal can influence how much individuals within a population are related to other individuals um, in a different population or even within a population. And this can have really important consequences for um, like population health and whatnot. And finally, um, it can also influence metapopulation dynamics. So individuals do move between populations. So if you think about like forest patches, right? If there are birds moving between these forest patches, um, that can influence the dynamics of populations within these different um, populations. So another reason that we are really interested in understanding, um, studying dispersal and studying the different consequences of dispersal is that understanding the impact of dispersal is actually really crucial for conservation efforts. And so this comes in two different ways. One is um, we need to understand what happens after individuals move in order to better predict how populations will respond to habitat fragmentation. Right, so as habitat is destroyed across the landscape and um, becomes patchier and more isolated, that might affect how individuals are moving across that landscape, and which in turn may affect kind of the survival of the populations and the species. It's also important to understand study dispersal in order to evaluate how effective different conservation actions might be. So one um, slightly controversial like management action that you can take now are assisted translocations where humans um, move individual animals uh, from one or plants, move individual organisms um, from one place to another. And usually these assisted translocations are done in cases where um, we believe that the organisms themselves would not be able to disperse without help. Um, and the hope is that 
these translocations can result in what is called genetic rescue, where the population grows in size because of these, uh, the addition of these new translocated individuals. And also um, for genetic rescue, the hope is that you would also see a decrease in inbreeding levels, um, which then means the population will be in, um, will have more genetic diversity and might therefore be better to adapt to any kind of changing environments or other um, potential new uh, consequences. So we know that dispersal and understanding what happens um, with dispersal is really important. The problem is, is that being able to study the consequences of dispersal is actually quite hard to do. Um, and that's true for a number of reasons. One is that uh, in most systems, it's actually really hard to be able to directly measure dispersal distance. Because what this requires is you'd have to track individual animals throughout their lifetimes, or I guess there's plant dispersal, but this is the Rochester Birding Association, so I'm just gonna talk about animals for now. Um, but you have to be able to track the movements of individual animals throughout their lifetimes, and that is actually quite hard to do, um, especially for large numbers of animals. And in some species, you think about, say, um, some nocturnal mammals, which you almost never see. This can be um, quite hard. Um, a related issue is if you're interested in monitoring a single population, then you typically need to be able to identify who immigrants are, right? So um, this requires tracking individuals and like banding individuals so you can actually individually identify individuals in a population over time and being able to notice when someone new shows up. And then finally, um, if we're interested in understanding how dispersal affects survival and reproductive success, then you have to be able to actually measure individual reproductive success in a population over time. Um, and ideally, you would want to be able to do this for multiple generations. Um, and this is important because a lot of studies typically kind of go out, sample a population for one or two, maybe three years. Um, and so the picture you would get is really short-term. You would only see kind of short-term consequences of dispersal events. But if we're thinking about sustainability, it's really important to be able to say, okay, if what is, what is gonna happen in this population five to 10 years from now, um, or even longer. And so, Given the um, large amount of data that you need to collect in order to be able to study dispersal, um, one of the few um, ideal study systems for studying dispersal are a handful of long-term demographic studies. So these are field-based studies where scientists and volunteers have um, monitored a single population of individually banded individuals for a very long time. Um, and these studies are really nice because one, uh, it allows you to track a single population across multiple generations. If everyone is individually banded, then you have the ability to um, identify immigrants. If these individuals are censused in um, you know, rough lo geographic locations of them, across the years, then you have the ability to measure dispersal distances. Um, and uh, you also will have the ability to be able to track um, like the number of offspring produced and survival, et cetera. So um, my lab actually works on one of these uh, long-term demographic studies. We do a lot of work on the Florida scrub jay, this beautiful blue bird here. Um, so there are a couple aspects about the biology of this bird that make it really, make them really amenable to study. So um, they're a cooperative breeder, which means that offspring of the species, they don't leave home or disperse immediately. They typically delay dispersal 
and stay home and help their parents raise future generation of offspring. These are typically going to be half siblings or full siblings. Um, they're restricted to this really unique fire maintained scrub habitat that you can kind of see. Um, this is a photo taken by my collaborator of a Florida scrub, scrub jay looking over some pristine scrub habitat. Um, so this scrub habitat has been destroyed a lot because of humans for development and also lack of management. So these birds are federally threatened. They're non-migratory and highly territorial and philopatric. So this means that individuals don't leave, which is nice. Um, and they also don't move very far. And so it's possible for us to follow the same individuals throughout their lifetimes. And also their offspring don't disperse very far. So we're, we can also kind of monitor the offspring of individuals in our population. They're socially monogamous birds and they're mostly genetically monogamous. So um, what this means is that the relationships that we observe in the field tend to be correct. Um, we do check everything with genetics, but in general, we can reconstruct really accurate pedigrees using field observations alone. And for those of you who have um, try to work with birds in the wild or um, have done banding or whatnot, you would appreciate another important aspect about the Florida scrub jay, which is that they are addicted to peanuts, um, which makes them very easy to work with. Uh, but I should say that these, um, these photos do not show typical field work behavior. We actually try to interact with them as little as possible but it's convenient that we can attract them with peanuts and makes them easier to count. So as I mentioned earlier, Florida scrub jays are federally threatened um, and they've drastically declined due to habitat loss. Um, so the map of Florida in the middle is showing the historic range of the Florida scrub jays in gray and their current range in green. You can see it's highly fragmented um, and the numbers of jays have declined by 97% in the past century and more than 50% in the past 20 years. So there's been an individual-based study at um, Archibald Biological Station starting in 1969. Um, I, if you ever get a chance to go to Florida, I highly recommend visiting. Archibald Biological Station is kind of one of the premier and one of the oldest field stations in the United States. Um, and it's a really beautiful, the Florida scrub ecosystem is this really beautiful ecosystem. Um, and the scrub jays are great birds. So there's a ton of work that uh, has gone into the study and continues to go into the study. Um, so the entire population is censused once a month. Um, we have a team of, uh, technicians and staff who go out and basically drive around to every territory um, to call the birds in and we mark down every individual is given a unique combination of color bands so we can identify everyone in the field. Um, and we just mark down everybody we see once a month. This means that we can collect fairly accurate data on individual lifespans for every bird in our population for the past 50 plus years. Uh, we also have really complete breeding records. So we monitor about 80 to 100 different family groups. Um, and every nest of every family group is found each year. And then these nests are really carefully monitored. So we know exactly when they lay eggs, how many eggs they lay, how many of those eggs hatch, when those eggs hatch, and we also know the fates of all of the nestlings that are born in our population. Um, because we census the population once a month and we do record where every individual was located during these population censuses, uh, we do have the ability, we do have direct measures of dispersal. Um, so we know where an individual is born and we know where it moves to. Um, and then Importantly for my work, um, starting in around 1999, my collaborators started taking blood samples from every single individual in the population. So 
Um, every nestling that is born is sampled, um, any new immigrants that show up. So we, because all the birds in our population are banded, if an unbanded bird shows up, we call them NOBAs um, for no bands. We know that they are an immigrant um, from another population. And so we typically go out and try to trap them and ban them. And then um, so we can kind of follow their the rest of their lives in our population. Um, there's also a lot of uh, ecological data that's collected at our study site. So we have measures of habitat quality. All of the territories are mapped every year. So we know the size of the territory defended by each family group. Um, we There's a weather station, local weather station on the field site. So we can collect a lot of different climate variables. Um, another important aspect about the scrub is that the this ecosystem is really closely linked to the natural fire cycle. So Florida is the lightning capital of the United States. Um, and historically, lightning has caused wildfires fairly periodically. And so a lot of the organisms in this ecosystem have, um, their lives are very closely linked to the natural fire cycle. And so it's really important um, to periodically burn the scrub. And so the Field station does do periodic managed burns, um, and we have complete records of the fire history um, of all of the territories on our study site. So this is just like a lot of monitoring and uh, an amazing wealth of data. And so over the past 50 years, um, we've accumulated complete life history and also a bunch of phenotypic measures for more than 10,000 individuals on a 14 generation pedigree. And so here, what this kind of mass is showing you, all the um, like circles and squares are individuals and the lines are showing relationships among these different individuals. Um, and our longest lineages we can trace back for more than 14. Actually, it should be longer. I made this figure in 2013. Um, so it's probably um, a little bit longer now, but essentially, what I'm hoping to show with this kind of massive um, ball of spaghetti is that we have a lot of data for a lot of individuals. Um, and then since a lot of our work is also interested in trying to understand genetic variation in individuals, um, another important piece of data that we've um, started collect or that we have collected and are adding to is very comprehensive genomic data um, for all of the individuals in our population over time. So down here in the histogram, I'm showing you um, the total number of birds in our population over time in gray, and then the number of individuals for whom we have some genomic data for. So we've gone and um, either sequenced their genomes or have used other ways to collect information, molecular information. Um, so these individuals are shown in blue. And as you can see, we've genotyped nearly every single individual in this population for more than 10 years. And so this is kind of this wealth of genomic, um, environmental, demographic, and phenotypic data from a population with a known genealogy or pedigree, really provides kind of a gold mine for asking and directly testing a lot of different core predictions of evolutionary biology theory in nature. And so what my lab does is we um, develop genomic resources and also computational tools that um, basically combine genomics and pedigree data from these amazing multi decadal demographic studies like the Florida Scrub Jay study at Archbold in order to ask fundamental questions about short-term evolution in natural populations or rapid evolution. Um, so the kind of big themes of the work in my lab are to characterize um, the different evolutionary processes that shape patterns of genetic variation through space and time, um, and to try to understand the links between genetic variation um, to variation in individual phenotypes, individual fitness, and eventually population dynamics. 
So today I thought I would tell you about some of our work um, looking at the consequences of dispersal, um, both within and among populations. So let's start with look, thinking about dispersal within a population. So from our detailed monitoring data, um, we noticed that Florida scrub jays have a really strong preference for short dispersal distances. So on the right here, I'm showing you um, the map of our study site, our Archibald Biological Station, and the blue arrows are basically showing dispersal events of females um, throughout in our, within our study site over the years. Um, and we know that the average dispersal distance for females is actually quite much higher than the average dispersal distance for males. Um, the sex bias dispersal is a fairly common pattern in birds um, and is often thought to be a mechanism for uh, trying to avoid inbreeding, right? So if you are siblings in the same nest, if the males travel um, or if the males stay close to home and the females travel farther, in theory, you're less likely to um, pair with a sibling. Um, so we were interested in trying to understand how dispersal distances might affect levels of inbreeding in the Florida scrub jay. And one of the first things we did was to look at actual observed dispersal distances of um, at this point, our data set includes a, a thousand birds, um, a few thousand birds over time. And compare that to um, the null distribution. So in this case, we wanted to know our actual observed um, dispersal distances shorter or any different from what we would expect under a model of random mating. So. The model of random mating here is if males and females present in our population in a given year mated randomly. Um, and so we can basically construct models where we take all potential male-female pairs in a population in a given year and calculate their dispersal distance that's shown in yellow um, and then compare that to the dispersal distances of the actual pairs that formed in blue. And you can see here that the dispersal, the observed dispersal distances are way lower than what we would expect if birds were just moving across and um, the, our population randomly. Um, and so this indicates that there's a very strong preference for short distances. Um, we actually tried to fit models where um, we tested for um, different factors that might predict whether or not a given male and female um, actually paired. And the strongest predictor is dispersal distance. Um, and as expected, uh, individuals typically or strongly prefer to pair with individuals who are really close to their natal nest where they grew up. And so these birds just don't like moving. And as a consequence of that, um, we actually see um, increased inbreeding in our population. So these birds don't move very far. And what this means is that if you don't move very far, you're more likely to pair with an individual who is more related to you than if you just um, randomly sampled a given individual. So here, what I'm showing you is um, for every year of our study. Um, so we start our analyses in 1990 because the use uh, the study track kind of ex was quite small when the when the population monitoring first began in 1969, and they kind of expanded in size. And by 1990, they were monitoring kind of the full study extent. Um, so we can calculate uh, how related um, male-female pairs should be if they were kind of just randomly choosing mates throughout the population. And, in, and so those uh, values are shown in yellow. And we can compare that to the relatedness of the actual male-female pairs in blue. Um, and in many of our years, we see that the observed breeding pairs 
are much more closely related to each other than we would expect under a model of random mating. Um, and since we have the pedigree, we can actually go in and look at different relationship types. Um, so here I'm showing you the proportion of pairs that are parent offspring pairs. So mom paired with a son or dad paired with a daughter, um, full sibling pairs, half sibling pairs, grandparent, grandchild pairs, um, and also aunt, uncle, nibbling. So nibbling is just the gender neutral term for niece or nephew. And it was interesting to see that we actually see a higher proportion of parent offspring pairs than we would expect um, by chance. And this apparent inbreeding preference is completely driven by the really strong preference for very short dispersal distances. Scrub jays don't like to move very far from home. Um, and the consequence is that they just pair with somebody who is more related to them than if they had ventured a little further away. Um, and so this here is showing the relatedness of pairs. Once again, comparing actual observed male-female pairs um, compared to what we would expect if they were mating randomly. Um, but here, um, we're doing these comparisons binned by dispersal distance. So you can see there's actually no difference in relatedness of observed um, and ex expected pairs conditional on dispersal distance, but you can see that um, for shorter dispersal distances, we just have more related pairs. So it's interesting here that limited dispersal is um, increasing inbreeding in the population. This is problematic because we know that inbreeding um, causes reduced survival and reproductive success at multiple life history stages. This phenomenon is called inbreeding depression. Um, we have found evidence for this at different um, stages of the life cycle. So parents that are more related to each other. So if your parents are more related, then their offspring are going to be more inbred. So uh, parents that are more related to each other have lower hatching success. A higher proportion of their eggs never successfully hatch. Um, nestlings who are more inbred are have lower weights. Um, and we know that weight is an important predictor of survival. Um, we also looked at kind of survival to different life stages. So did they fledge or leave the nest? Did they obtain nutritional independence from their parents? Did they survive to become a year old or did they survive and establish to become a breeder? And we see that inbred individuals have lower, significantly lower probabilities of survival than less inbred birds. Um, inbred individuals also have shorter lifespans. They don't live as long um, and they have um, smaller lifetime reproductive success. And what that means is that they just produce fewer offspring throughout their lifetimes compared to um, non-inbred birds. So it's weird, a little weird to see that limited dispersal within our population is driving higher than expected inbreeding levels. Um, we think that uh, the costs of inbreeding depression are outweighed by the social benefits of staying near home. So Florida scrub jays are highly territorial birds. I think they spend like 80% of their life just defending their territory boundaries. Um, but we've shown that if they live near kin, if they live near relatives, um, they spend less time defending those boundaries. Um, and so it seems like the benefits of staying near home, where you know the social landscape, you know your neighbors, these benefits may outweigh um, any potential costs of potentially being more related to your mate and having more inbred children. Um, but we're doing some more analyses to try to really tease apart kind of the, cons the long-term consequences of dispersal within our population. What about dispersal among populations? So I mentioned that 
we have the ability to identify immigrants and track immigrants into the population over time. And from our monitoring data, we notice that there's relatively high but um, decreasing levels of immigration into the population. So this plot here is just showing you the number of new immigrants that appear in our population over time. And you can see that it's decreasing. We think that immigration into the population is decreasing because um, the surrounding habitat, so our field site um, undergoes a lot of habitat management and prescribed burns, but the surrounding area, there isn't that as much habitat management. And from kind of annual peripheral surveys, we know that the populations nearby are getting smaller over time, and some of them have actually gone extinct. And so it's not super surprising to us um, that the number of birds, new birds coming into our population um, is decreasing over time. So we wanted to know, like, is this a problem? Um, and also, who are these immigrants? What can we say about the immigrants? Um, we looked at genomic data for a lot of these birds. Um, and we found that immigrants were less heterozygous than residents. So um, heterozygosity just means, again, if you have two copies of the same allele, what are the, um, or sorry, two copies of the same gene, how often are these copies different? Um, so more heterozygous individuals are typically less inbred. Um, and throughout, so here we're just comparing the heterozygosity of um, resident birds, so birds that were born on our study site versus known immigrants. Um, and you can see that immigrants have much lower heterozygosity. This implies that immigrants are more inbred. Um, and this is consistent with what we know about where we think the immigrants are coming from. So we think that they're coming from much smaller and more isolated populations and individuals in these smaller fragments or um, fragment populations are likely going to be more inbred. Um, even though these immigrants are likely more inbred than our residents, they were still important in contributing genetic variation to our population. So we looked at this in two different ways. First on the bottom here, I'm showing you um, mean pairwise uh, identity by descent. So this is a measure of how related individuals are at the level of their genome. Um, and you can see that observed um, resident resident pairs are shown in blue, immigrant resident pairs are shown in green, immigrant immigrant pairs are shown in yellow, and then kind of all of our male female pairs are shown in black. Um, if you compare kind of the yellow and green lines, you can see they're a lot lower than the blue lines. This means that immigrants are less related to each other and to the residents than our resident birds are to each other. Um, and so they're bringing in kind of new genetic variation. We can actually use the pedigree to model exactly how much genetic variation we think is being brought in via immigrants. Um, so if we kind of start our simulations in 1990 and then just look at um, the expected genetic contribution of incoming immigrants appearing in the population starting in 1991, each of the colored lines kind of shows how much genetic variation is brought in by each incoming cohort of immigrants. And the black line is showing the expected total contribution of all immigrants who've appeared in our population since 1990. You can see that by about 2013, 75% of the genetic variation present in our population was brought in um, via an immigrant. So we know that they um, can be really important um, to maintaining levels of genetic variation and keeping inbreeding down in our population. So I mentioned earlier that um, immigration rates have been decreasing over time. And because of this, we actually see increasing levels of inbreeding in our population. So here this plot is showing the inbreeding, co the mean inbreeding coefficient of the birth cohort, so all the nestlings born in our population over time. 
and it's actually significantly increasing over time. Um, and because of inbreeding depression, so we know more inbred birds have lower survival um, and lower reproductive success, we actually see a trend of um, reduced fitness. So juvenile survival to nutritional independ to independence, so survival to about 90 days um, is decreasing over time in our study population. Um, so looking at kind of the importance of dispersal among populations, so focusing on dispersal into our population, we know that it's really important in contributing genetic variation to our population. And we've um, been able to show that reduced immigration into our population over time has actually led to increasing levels of inbreeding and reduced fitness. So one of the projects um, we then wanted to ask is, okay, it's reduced immigration is, has these important kind of genetic and fitness consequences, but does it actually have any impact on population dynamics? Is it changing our population size over time? And so we um, can use the census data to actually um, estimate population growth rates over time. Um, this is work done by a, a graduate student in my lab right now. And so here I'm showing you the population growth rate in our population. Um, this is looking at a longer time period. Um, so from 1989 to 2021, you can see it fluctuates a lot, right? So some years our population uh, has a positive growth rate, so it's growing in size. And then um, other time, other years it decreases. But overall, if you just take um, the asymptote, uh, you can see that um, kind of average across all of these years, our population growth rate has been at zero. And that's what the green line is showing. And so what this means is that the population, the size of our study population has remained relatively stable over time. Um, and we wanted to try to understand um, what are the factors that are maintaining this population um, kind of stable population sizes over time. And in order to do this, um, we used models um, that kind of looked at, considered the floor, the life cycle of a floor scrub jay. So if you think about um, all the birds in a population over time, we can categorize them into different uh, basically life stages. So some individuals will be juveniles. These will be individuals that were born that year. Um, other individuals um, are helpers. So remember these birds are cooperative breeders. Um, and so some offspring delay dispersal, stay home to help their, help their parents raise future generations of offspring. Um, so juveniles can either uh, transition to becoming helpers or um, they can become a breeder. We know that uh, breeder experience is, has an important effect on kind of the number of offspring a given pair has. So we separate breeders into novice pairs um, so these are pairs who have never bred together before compared to experienced pairs. We see that the more experience um, a given male-female scrub jay has, the better they are at raising offspring and having their offspring survive. Um, and then these different pairs of individuals, so novice pairs and experienced pairs, can either survive to the next year, they can also produce offspring. And sometimes we see cases where um, when a particular breeder loses its mate or something goes wrong, it will sometimes go back to helping. And then immigrants can show up in our population and they um, can either join a territory and help raise the young at that particular territory, or they can um, pair with another individual and start breeding. And so they would um, become a novice pair. And so given this, the life cycle of the Florida scrub jay, we can actually translate this life cycle into math, um, into a matrix. 
and use um, what's called matrix population models to connect these different demographic rates. So um, how often do kind of individuals of one stage transition to another stage? And so this reflects things like um, survival probabilities, immigration rate, um, and a fecundity or like the number of offspring produced in a given year. Um, we can connect these different demographic rates to predict population growth. And um, conversely, we can also use these models to ask, given what we know about population growth rates, how important is survival to population growth or how important is fecundity and how important is immigration? So using these models, we can actually show um, for every one of these different vital rates, how much they actually contribute to the variation we see in population growth rates over time. So for instance, here, we found that the most important, um, the most important vital rate that contributes to variation growth rate is survival. That's not that surprising. So especially kind of survival of experienced breeders can explains about 25% of the variation we see in population growth rates. Um, after survival, we can see that immigration actually can have a large impact on um, population dynamics and contributes to nearly 50% of the variance that we see in population growth rates. So we know that immigration is important and we know that immigration is decreasing. So why aren't we seeing a decrease in population growth rates over time? Um, it turns out that this decrease in immigration over time is actually counteracted by an increase in breeder survival. Um, so we fit a bunch of models to look at the effects of um, different environmental variables and also the effect of year, the effect of time on um, these on our population growth rates. And this graph here, uh, positive effect size is showing that um, these rates are increasing over time. So you can see that um, and the asterisks show the responses that are actually significantly different from zero. Um, so you can see that breeder survival is significantly increasing over time whereas both um, male and female immigration is decreasing over time. And so what we, we think what is happening is that um, inbreeding or this decrease in immigration doesn't actually decrease population growth rates over time because we're seeing, because it's being counteracted by an increase in breeder survival. Okay, so to summarize kind of some of the work that I shared with you today, um, we looked at the genetic fitness and demographic consequences of dispersal, both within and among populations in the Florida scrub jay. Um, within our study po population, we showed that there's a very strong preference for short dispersal distances, um, and that it, this is creating higher inbreeding levels than expected under random mating. We know that there's inbreeding depression in our population, so more inbred individuals have lower survival and reproductive success, but we think that individuals still prefer to stay close to home because of the social benefits um, of being close to where they grew up. Um, dispersal among populations or immigration um, into our population is really important to contribute genetic variation and kind of Decreasing immigration rates through time in our study population has led to increasing levels of inbreeding and also reduced fitness of um, the birth cohort. But so far, there aren't any demographic impacts of this decreased immigration because they're counteracted by increased breeding, breeder survival. One thing to note, though, is that um, it is a little worrisome to see the increased inbreeding levels. And so because of this, we're actually um, partnering with Florida Fish and Wildlife to do some translocation experiments um, to see if like human assisted 
dispersal between populations can lead to um, increased population growth. And so this is a project that's um, being done in collaboration with a lab at Michigan State University. Um, we translocated a couple individuals into a small population of Florida scrub jays on the east coast of Florida. And we're just, and so far, the translocated birds are have established their breeding um, and they're surviving. And we're tracking this population to see what will happen over the next um, five to 10 years. All right, everything I talked to you about today could not have been possible without the huge and amazing crew of interns and staff who collect and have collected um, field data at Archibald Biological Station every year. Um, I'd like to thank my wonderful team of collaborators and students, the various folks who provided comments and my funding sources. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. That's a great question. So Archbold Biological Station, uh, it's about 10 kilometers north and south, and it's long and skinny. So it's like 10 kilometers north to south, and I want to say... I, this is probably wrong, like three to five kilometers wide. Um, most of our work is actually only in the northern half of this entire tract. Um, so I think in total, there are probably like 250 or so family groups. Um, and most of the work is focused on the hundred or so groups in the northern half of the study site. This is because of historical reasons. Um, in the past, Steve Shea, uh, who's one of the collaborators on some of this work, um, was monitoring the scrub jays in the southern half of the station. Um, but he is an endocrinologist and behavior behavioral ecologist. And so his group would do a lot of experimental manipulations. Um, and we wanted to try to study kind of an untouched population. So a lot of our work only focuses on the northern half. Yeah. Oh, can, they... can the immigrants come from completely outside Archbold? Are there? Yes, most of the immigrants come from completely outside Archbold. So, and we, the so South Track birds- extends beyond the boundaries of our- Yeah, beyond the boundaries. Yeah. Like they're, the South Track birds are banded. They're in our databases. So we know who they are. Um, and we also know um, there was a population of birds in the suburbs, just a few kilometers north of Archbold that was studied for many years. And so we know um, some of our birds came from those populations, um, and we're guessing that some come from other patches of scrub further away. But one of the things that um, is actually surprising is that we actually don't know what types of habitats scrub jays use to move between scrub patches. Um, so we have an ongoing project right now led by my postdoc, uh, Shaylee Shaw, where we're um, looking at the landscape across a bigger spatial region. So we're looking across the Lake Wales Ridge wildlife um, area and um, looking at, we've sampled birds in multiple populations. And then we're using genetics to try to estimate how much movement there was between populations and connect that with the landscape to try to figure out what types of habitat they're actually using to move between populations. But one of the things I would love to do is do more tracking of the birds to try to figure out like how far do they move? How far, we don't actually know how far away are some of our immigrants come from. And it'd be great to figure that out. 
Hi, that was a great talk. So I just have a quick question about your disposal distance. Is that in feet or is that in meters? What is the unit? Oh, uh, dispersal distances are in meters. Yes. Uh, has any of these ideas been you have they been used to help rescue bird populations that are on the verge of extinction? Um, in fact, are there any strategies that you think you might be be able to apply in terms of habitat or immigration or things of this sort for certain types of species? Um. So. I can tell you that the um, one of the stories I told you caused a lot of concern in the Florida scrub jay community. So this finding that um, reduced immigration through time has led to increased inbreeding levels and reduced fitness in a demographically stable population was highly concerning. Um, and because of that, that did prompt um, Florida and Fish and Wildlife to do some translocations. Um, and so one of the translocation experiments right now is in a tiny population. So there's um, at Jonathan Dickinson State Park on the eastern um, side of Florida, eastern coast of Florida, there's actually quite a bit of good habitat, good scrub habitat there. Um, but there were like two family groups of chase. And so that population was essentially going to go extinct um, if we didn't do anything. And so Florida Fish and Wildlife translocated a few family groups there and we're monitoring to see what will happen. Um, I think in general, this work is um, more broadly is going to help kind of inform our understanding of when genetic rescue might or might not work. Um, one of the things we're working on in the lab right now is actually looking more carefully at um, the kind of survival and reproductive success of immigrants and their offspring and their grand offspring and great grand offspring. So we want to get to get a better understanding of um, what happens to these immigrant individuals and their lineages essentially when they show up in a population. And this will have a lot of important consequences for genetic rescue, which is right now a really hot topic in conservation. Mike? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. So, so the increasing survival of breeding birds seems really counterintuitive given everything you said about the decrease in immigration and the consequences of inbreeding. Do you have any thoughts on what is leading to the improving survival rates? That is a great question. Why is there improving survival rates? Um, it's a great question, and that's something that we are trying to figure out now. Um, part of it could be that we know there are a lot of density-dependent effects, and density is decreasing um, in our population. Um, we're also doing some more modeling to try, and I didn't... Um, include this in the talk today, but we're also kind of trying to disentangle, you know, we know that acorn abundance affects survival and reproduction um, and also climate. So trying to model these different factors and to better understand why we're seeing these different rates. But yeah, that's something that we are still looking into. And one more question from Zoom. Uh, do immigrants take on primarily breeder roles or helper roles uh, or a mix? Also, are immigrants primarily female as suggested by your dispersal data? Uh, yes, immigrants are predominantly female. Um, and what roles do breeders take? I mean, breeders do... So breeders do um, a lot of territory defense. Um, they also build the nests and kind of mom incubates. Dad primarily does more of the feeding. Helpers do, can help with provisioning nestlings, but usually um, they're kept away from the female during the early parts because the male doesn't want, male breeder doesn't want any um, <coughs> potential copulations. Um, Helpers can also assist in territory defense. So I guess they all 
I mean, helpers essentially participate in all the activities a typical breeder does, except for incubation, nest building. I could be wrong in nest building. They don't incubate and um, they don't help provision the young until a little bit later. I was wondering because you mentioned that scrub jays don't like to move very far mm -hmm. away from their area. So does loss of habitat really affect them or they, I mean, would if they had better habitat, do you think they would disperse farther? If I think, um, I think loss of habitat definitely affects them. One thing I didn't say is that they have giant territories. So like average territory size is about 15 hectares. Um, and they, uh, there's definitely um, a difference in kind of movement within a scrub patch versus outside a scrub patch. So this is work done um, kind of before I joined the project showing that you can see um, a decrease in, a large decrease in relatedness from genetic markers, which is one way of inferring how much movement there is between populations. Um, and that you can see a pretty large drop in relatedness, even for small gaps in habitat. So they really hate moving through non-scrub habitat. I don't know if that answered your question, but I mean, one thing that's interesting about populate our about our study population is the habitat is super saturated. Um, like the minute a breeding vacancy, a, like if a breeder breeding individual dies, they're replaced because there's just so many helpers just like waiting for an opportunity. I, I was wondering whether if if there if the habitat was limitless, would they naturally disperse I think farther so. apart? Yeah, because mm -hmm. you just move like one territory at a time. And... Mm -hmm. I have one more. Uh, do immigrants take on only breeder roles? Do they spend time as helpers? As immigrants sometimes do spend time as helpers. So there's really nice work done by um, Young Ha Sa, who just completed her PhD at Cornell with John Fitzpatrick, showing that sometimes you get staging. So immigrants do, and in our matrix model, um, we do account for the fact that immigrants can show up as breeders or as helpers. So they are sexually dimorphic under UV light, which we cannot observe. So to us, they are not <laughs> sexually dimorphic, but to the birds, they are. Um, so that's actually why they started taking blood samples in back in the 90s, um, is they used blood, they take blood samples from all the nestlings when they're 11 days old to sex them molecularly. We can behaviorally sex um, some adults. So females have this very characteristic hiccup call um, that only females perform that you often see during like territorial disputes. Um, but they would usually have to survive to become an adult before we would be able to behaviorally sex them. So right now we, everybody, as blood, we get a blood sample from everyone if they survive to 11 days old and um, use molecular techniques to sex them. So when the mimic arrives, you don't know right away. Yeah, we don't know unless they hiccup, then we know. But <laughs> we don't often know. And there's like actually fun instances. Um, we have had uh, like male male pairs like form a really long pair bond and it's kind of fun to like go back through old field notebooks and people and there's like hmm we think that like this is weird this bird has never laid an egg and like turns out when you molecularly sex them they were both male but they had a long-term pair bond how much how much does other enemies take the nestlings other birds or snakes or um 
you know, mammals that feed on the eggs? Yeah, so um, uh, survival, so most mortality occurs um, early on in life. Um, so nest depredation happens often um, and nest predators include snakes, other birds. Um, those are our most common ones. Uh, we've had, I think at one point we had like ants kill a nestling, uh, which sounds terrible. Um, so, and there are hawks and um, blue jays that also eat nestlings. So predation is definitely very, like an important driver of early life survival. Um, it's probably also an important driver of like adult survival overall too. Did that answer your question? Okay. Seems to me if you have a relatively stable population and the family groups tend to cluster together, and not move very far. If you have a successful breeding pair leading to other successful breeding pairs, you're not going to get a lot of dispersal, and that is going to increase the inbreeding. Mm -hmm. So um, seems to me if you want a successful overall population that is not inbred, they may be dependent on disruptive events like fires, hurricanes, and um well let's see what else occurs in florida could be um ki a killing heat wave that kind of thing could disrupt things enough to force dispersal and thus decrease inbreeding yeah it's possible i mean we've had some really large fire events um in our study site and that it would be, it could be cool to really to go back and see like, cause we know when there's a really big fire event, the territory boundaries kind of get reshuffled. Um, so it could be interesting to see how those big fire events impact dispersal events that year or the following year. Yeah, so this is the value of a long-term study mm -hmm. to look at uh, phenomena that don't occur every year and try to get some idea of the overall picture of dispersal and, and inbreeding. Yeah. Um, dispersal has been studied in migratory birds in the past. Are there any studies of migratory birds that could be compared with your non-migratory birds? Something, for instance, like chickadees don't, um, black capped chickadees don't migrate very far, but they migrate. And do your conclusions apply to birds that would have uh, short or long migratory pa um, parts of their existence? Do you have? Do you understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, it would apply as long as they're philopatric. So what really matters is um, the breeding, this like where they are in space when they're breeding, right? Because um, if, at least in thinking about dispersal within a population and also among populations, what we really think, uh, what really matters is how inbred are the mating pairs. Um, so. I think if there's a migratory population by individuals return to the same breeding site, then you could ask very similar questions. Well, have there been studies of migratory populations that could come that you could compare some of what you've learned here of a non-migratory bird with yeah. a migratory uh, population? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know of many migratory populations that have been monitored for uh, multiple yeah okay. for multiple generations okay one of the things is as was said earlier like these long-term studies are incredibly valuable um because you can there's so much you can learn about them it also gives us the ability to look at trends over time so one of the things we're looking into now is you know with climate change do we see climate change affecting our population trends? We know that the El Nino cycle 
has an important impact on demographic, um, different vital rates in our population over time. Um, and there's some evidence of kind of changes in the timing of breeding in our population over time because of warming. So, but like these types of studies are only possible if you can do monitoring for decades. Um, and it's really hard to keep these studies funded sure, thank and you. going. Mm -hmm. Nancy, thank you very much. Thank you all.